Hi, everyone. I'm Atan Thomas, and thank you for joining us here for a Black History Month panel discussion powered by Athletes for Hope and in conjunction with Reverend Jesse Jackson's historic Rainbow Push Coalition, um, who have graciously purchased copies of my new book, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, The Fight Against American Traditions, which many at Southern University will be receiving, including the student athletes on the panel today. So let me introduce our panel. We have um, Ms. Peyton Mercado from the softball team. How are you doing? I'm really have, good, thank you. Good, good, good. We have Xavier Moore from the baseball team. How are you doing, sir? And we have, uh, I want to say your name right. Is it Kaylin Givens? Colin. Colin Givens uh, from the football team. Uh, so thank you all for coming and uh, being a part of this. And I want to say first, y'all have had a tumultuous 48 hours um, there on campus. And I just want to explain to everybody what's been going on. Um, you know, so officials are still investigating the bomb threats um, made against at least 16 historic, historically black colleges and universities on Tuesday, February 1st, um, the first day of Black History Month, which came less than a day after six other HBCUs were targeted by similar threats. Um, according to CNN, uh, the HBCUs targeted included Alcorn State, um, Coppin State, Morgan State, Jackson State, uh, Mississippi Valley State, Kentucky State, Spelman, um, Howard University, Xavier, um, uh, Southern University, and, and, and many more. So y'all were locked down um, on campus earlier this week, right? And then campuses, uh, classes were canceled as the authorities investigated. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. And it's 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 crazy that we're this is 2022 and we're talking about something like this um, in Black History Month because this is not what we were going to talk about. We were going to be having a whole different direction with our conversation, but um, after this happened, it, it definitely needed our attention. And I want to ask all of y'all first: How are you dealing with everything? Like, what is the what is the temperature on campus right now? And ladies first, we'll start first with Miss uh, Peyton Macabre. Um, with the situation, we actually talked about it in my race and relations class. And we just think that, you know, this month is supposed to be about uplifting one another and, you know, embracing our culture and everything. And we feel like even if it was a fake bomb threat like a lot of people are alleging or if it was reality it's still scary that the fact that we're going to school where we feel comfortable where we're in a family and even as an athlete to even go to practice the next day it's like well is anyone gonna call another threat while we're at practice and we have to stop what we're doing and be scared for our lives so it's just to me it feels really sad that I have to worry about going to school because Others want to do harmful things to innocent um, young adults trying to get an education for themselves. And you know, and the fact that it was done just just specifically to HBCUs, um, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna go to you, Colin. That you know, again, this is 2022. This is the 1960s. Um, you know, and this is not what we should be discussing. But what does that tell you right now that this is the topic of discussion, and then y'all are living through it in real time? It, it tells me that we're we're not past our history yet. And that's sad to say that HBCUs are getting targeted and we're we're going at this HBU, HBCU spectrum in football. You can see like we're getting number one recruits in football and um, games sold out every day, uh, HBCU football games on ESPN. But then you come to the first day of Black History Month and yeah, 16 HBCUs get bomb threats. And that's, that's very scary. That's very scary. Um, Xavier, what has the conversation been with you and your teammates? Um, <clears throat> I guess kind of all over the place. It's hard to really wrap our head around everything that's going on. Uh, and like Peyton said, it's kind of scary because, I mean, first off, you kind of don't really, like, you get a bomb threat. You know, some people had a real early class and they think, oh, I just get to, you know, sleep in. Uh, but when you really think about it, like you said, the first day of Black History Month and only being HBCUs, uh, 
uh, that got the threats and not even talking about how the fact that most of the places those schools are, there's other schools right right across town or right real, real uh, close that also could have got bomb threats that didn't, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's, it's, it is a little scary and nerve wracking and uneasy. Um, I was reading on um, CNN, the FBI put out a statement and they said the investigation into the bomb threats um, is of the highest priority for the Bureau and involves more than 20 FBI field offices across the country. Um, then they said, although at this time no explosive devices have been found at any of the locations, the FBI takes all threats with the utmost seriousness and we are committed to thoroughly and aggressively investigating these threats. Um, but no arrests have been made yet. And I did see that as, uh, as the kind of stuck out. And um, they said they have some suspects and maybe, but no arrests. What, what do you think about that? Like what, what goes through your mind as you're hearing this and reading that no arrests have been made yet? Uh, let's start with you, Pam. It's kind of scary, um, especially because we're so close to other universities, like Stan was saying. It's not just us that it could impact. You don't know how big the bomb would be or anything like that. But another thing that does come to my attention when I think about that is sometimes I think, is it being taken as seriously as they're saying it to be? Because a lot of the times, even like our own history, we get left behind so much. And now that they're actually trying to be adamant about something, it's sad to say that it's hard to believe sometimes, but you still got to have that faith that they are doing so to protect mm-hmm. us. Um, I do appreciate that they have been saying that they have protected us. We don't know what the FBI is doing besides them, but um, it's still scary because someone could just be walking around and maybe to some places like you've seen Columbine with the shootings and um Boston with the marathon bombing, you don't get a notification for that. So it is kind of scary, especially with being Black History Month. You just never know. So I kind of live in fear just a little bit with that, but the only person after God, but it is scary. It's really scary. Um, Colin, do you share those sentiments or what, uh, what was your um, you know reaction to seeing what the FBI was saying and the fact that they didn't have any arrests yet? I mean, honestly, it's not a surprise. I mean, you, like history just kind of keeps repeating itself, which is sad. But I mean, we just got to keep our faith in God as we go through our days. And, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it's going to get better, but it, it is scary. It's very scary to, to know like somebody, they could probably have the wrong people, but we just got to keep, keep our faith. Xavier, let, let me ask you this. When you're talking to other athletes, because, you know, we, we there's an athlete community and, you know, you guys run into each other a lot. Um, and sometimes, it's, you know, that's who you hear speaking mostly, um, you know, congregating and things of that nature. Um, are people on campus kind of in fear right now? Are they angry? Are they frustrated? Like what all of the above? Like what what are the people on campus kind of saying and projecting right now at this moment? Um, I've kind of gotten a mix of everything. Uh, a lot of what they said is kind of the group consensus. Um, since we had the threat, I've only been around a few of my teammates. We haven't really all gotten back together yet. Uh, just. Uh Oh, I think you froze. All right. We'll come back to him. I think you froze a little bit. Um, one of the things that's, that's interesting in this, um, as athletes, you know, we have a, oh, I'm sorry, you froze a little bit. Keep, uh, go back to what you were saying. Cause I want to, I want you to finish your point. Okay. okay. Um, just shock really, like I said, uh, and not knowing what's next, but, uh, just trying to keep our faith as Colin says, staying steady. No, oh, that's that campus Wi-Fi. That's all good. This is the campus Wi-Fi. Um, uh, let, me, let me go back to you, Peyton. Um, you, you talked about it not being taken seriously enough. And, you know, that there's... So so in my book, um, Police Brutality and White Supremacy, uh, The Fight Against American Traditions, I examined the history of white supremacy in this country and how far back it goes. 
And, you know, it's still crazy to me that we're talking about this in 2022, but there's so many people that are saying, well, racism is a thing of the past. Like we don't have to, you know, think of that. It's not the 1960s anymore. It's not the 1950s anymore. We don't have those kind of issues. And then something like this happens. Um, you know, what does that make you think, you know, as you're, as you're looking at the comparatively, I mean, yes, we've come a long way, but you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, Ooh, that's that's quite a question. Um, it's just really hard sometimes to just, especially being a history major, we talk about these things a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to see that things really don't change. Like how Colin was saying before, history really does repeat itself. And one thing we talked about, and we were talking about critical race theory in my class the other day. Mm -hmm. We were discussing what would basically turn the world around or what would what would um, help kind of fight racism or prevent it. And I spoke up and I said knowledge. And I feel like if the world wouldn't be so full of hate if we all just gained a little bit of knowledge about each other. So I feel like we aren't being taken so seriously because of things that have been taught from the past and that are being brought back. So as long as we're knowledgeable about these things, then everything should be handled equally and accordingly. And we should all be treated as the same and nothing different. So I, and I feel like if it were to happen, I'll just use LSU as an example, but if it was like LSU, they'd probably have a lot of security there. All the police would probably be there, but it's really sad that the only police I saw on campus was campus police, not even Baton Rouge police department, like the day after, at least just to stay around just to make sure or no kind of reassurance from there. So I feel like if HBCUs were set as the priority, we would have been taken care of as a priority as we should be, but we we need that benefit from everyone's support of us. So so I've heard that from other people. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here in uh, Maryland and um, Bowie State and Morgan State and Coppin State are all close to here. And I've heard some of those same kind of reports that after they look on the news and they see the FBI and the people making their statements and things of that nature, they're saying they're going on our campus and they don't see any of that. They don't see any kind of presence. They don't see any kind of, you know, we're, we're making sure we get to the bottom of it. None of that going on, but they see it on the news. Is that is that what you saw too, Colin, or did you see something different? No, nah, that's exactly what I saw. Um, it was just campus police there. Uh, we, the day, actually the day of the bomb and like we were on campus that morning and uh, we had to stay around for a little bit, and I didn't see anybody but campus police. Mm. Wow, wow. So as so, let me ask you this: as athletes, you know, we have a a, a special ability um, to use our platforms. So in my in my in my previous book, We Matter: Athletes and Activism, I spoke with a lot of different athletes who have used their platforms. Uh, to speak out on issues that include, you know, racism, police brutality, and justice. Um, I interviewed athletes that I grew up admiring, like John Carlos and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Russell and Mahmoud Abdul-Aruf. And then I interviewed also present-day athletes, like Eric Reed, who was kneeling with Kaepernick the whole time, and, you know, Shamiko Holsglaw and Carmelo Anthony and, and all these different people. And so I, I want to ask you, do you all see yourselves as having the ability to use your platforms the way that these athletes have used their platforms to be able to speak? Because even with you, even doing this interview with me, you know, you're representing your 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 sport, you're representing your school and you're speaking out on the injustices that you've seen happening after this bomb threat happened at your university. So in my opinion, you know, you are in that tradition of all the athletes that I just named. But I want to ask you if you see yourself um, in that tradition. Xavier, I'll, I'll start with you. Not on the Wi-Fi. Can you hear me, Xavier? Okay, take it off mute. No, yeah, you got to take it off mute. Unmute yourself.
Uh, I don't know if he can unmute himself. All right, but keep working on that. Uh, Peyton, I'm going to come back to you, Xavier, though, because I want to get your input on that. Uh, Peyton, the, the same question that I, that I just asked. Do you see yourself uh, in, that, in that tradition of athlete activists? Um, yes, I do, actually. Um, my, my platform, I am reaching 20,000 followers um, on my Instagram platform. And on there... And all of my platforms, I do try to not only educate people's about, people about Black history and um, certain current events, but also things that involve the recent events. And I'll repost or I'll go on live and I'll talk about it. And another big thing that I had just um, had a live about, I, think, I believe yesterday is, um, was about mental health. Mm. And um, I just try to use my platform to voice my truth and what I believe needs to be put into the universe to make the world a better place. And it seems as though it's working because a lot of my audience is very involved with what I have to say and they really act upon it and they really do care about what I have to say. So as long as I can reach out to at least one person out of the 20,000 people on there, that's that's all I care about because if I can get through to somebody then and I can educate them or I can make them see things that they don't see on a daily basis, then I feel like my job is accomplished as a influencer or as a public figure on the media. That's beautiful. I, I want to encourage you to keep doing that. You know? <laughs> Thank you. No, really. I mean, I, I can't say it enough, especially so I read in your profile that you're, you know, one of your areas of focus are mental health. Yes. Um, and so one of the people that I interviewed um, in my book was Shamika Holsclaw. And if you're familiar with her, you know, she was one of the first people to to be open about her mental health. So I was playing with the Wizards while she was playing with the Mystics. And when she came out about her mental health and when she said that she was, you know, dealing, having mental health issues, struggling with different things, she didn't get any support. Like the support was not there. And, you know, and it's and it's times a hundred for on the men's side, because, you know, men, you know, you're supposed to be tough. And that's supposed to rub you wrong with your mental health. You know, they can understand a knee being hurt or an ankle being hurt, but your mental health. So it's just now starting to get where they can even pay it a little bit of attention, even though you still get the scrutiny that you that that, you know, that that comes with it when you do start speaking about your personal mental health. And so I the reason why I paused on this, because so many um, you know, especially young female athletes, they're suffering in silence because they don't want for people to scrutinize them if they come out because they see what happens. They see what happened to Naomi Osaka, like, you know, when she came out and said she had some anxiety with the media and the way that people jumped on her. So having athletes come out and, and speak about mental health, the importance of mental health, I can't say enough how important it is. So I just want to congratulate you on that and keep doing what you're doing with that. Um, you. Definitely, definitely. And Colin, same question to you. Do you see yourself in that tradition of athletes who are using their platform, um, being able to speak out on different causes? What are the causes that are most important to you? Yes, most definitely. Uh, but I do feel like we can do better. And my biggest thing is doing it together. Like as a, as a football team, as an athletic department, like we come together, like all of us are in a uh, SAC student athletic association council like we feel like i feel like athletes really do have the biggest voice on campus and mm -hmm. we're because we're like the biggest people on campus right and so what i've seen is honestly you know if we have an athletic party that's probably the biggest party that's going to happen mm -hmm. so if we have an athletic panel or we have an athletic march something like that I feel like we can bring the whole school together. So that is something that we're going to get to work on. You know, it's great. I, I, I pointed out this case that happened in Missouri, um, University of Missouri. And so they were having all these racial incidents happen. Um, this was like a few years ago. So I don't know if y'all remember when this happened, but I wrote about it in We Matter. Um, but they were having all these racial incidents happen on campus and the president wasn't doing anything. So there was all this uproar and it was, you know, all this different stuff happening. Like, you know, um, and then after this in the second semester, one of them got the idea to connect with the football team and the football team started speaking about it. 
And then the then the you know more people started standing with them, and then you just saw things move like quickly. Um, and they just what they did was they threatened to maybe possibly think about boycotting the game. That's all they did. They didn't say they was actually gonna boycott the game. They said they're thinking about it. They made references like, okay, we want to be in a place where we're safe. We want to be in a place where we're, you know, a safe environment and that our university have our, has our back. And we don't know if we want to play in a game where we're university. They referenced it. And you saw immediately the board, um, you know, brought the president up, looked at his track record. What was he doing to fix these different racial problems? And he was fired like in three days. Like it, it, it just shows the strength and the power when all the athletes come together. And I, you know, there's I, the thing that I love about this generation is so many of you are recognizing that power now because it wasn't always like that. You had a few here and there, but not like as a whole doing things together. I think that's just beautiful to see. Xavier, same question to you. Where do you see yourself in that history of athletes and activism? Um, I think I try to use my voice as much and as well as I can uh, because, Colin, like Colin said, we're we're the biggest on campus, but not only on campus, it's just as a whole, athletes are looked at rather even in a positive or negative way. Everybody's looking, you know, I mean, sports and everything is one of the biggest forms of entertainment. And I guess what put that in puts that in perspective for me is how often I do happen to deal with kids and stuff like that um, and how they will see. I mean, I'm in college now, but even a nine year old going to a high school basketball game or something they don't really put all that in perspective. You know, that's just something big to them. So they see that they want to do something to be involved in something. Now the kid wants to do it. Now he wants his friend to do it. Uh, so the ripple effect just starts. It definitely does. Um, do you all go and have y'all spoken to younger athletes? You know, I know sometimes it's harder to look at yourself as this big role model because you're in college. But younger athletes look at anyone who's older than them doing where they what they want to do um, you know, where they want to be able to get to and achieve as as someone who they want to pattern their life after and follow them. And, you know, they're inspired by them. You know, before it was interesting. Um, I don't know if y'all even remember this. This is way before y'all time. But Charles Barkley um, made a statement. He said, I'm not a role model. He was like, don't follow me. Don't don't listen to what I do. Don't, and that's not reality. Like, I know what he was trying to say. Like, yes, your your you know, your teacher should be your role models, your pastor, your, you know, but but really what young people follow are the people who they admire, who they watch, which is a lot of times athletes. Um, do you see yourself as that role model or is that a little bit too much pressure to put on yourself, you know, this this young in your life? Um, I'll start with you, Peyton. Let me start with you, Peyton. Okay. Um, I do see myself as a role model. Um I am big on giving back to my community. Um, so in California, I coach um, in an organization and I actually have my own team. Oh, wow. And then I also um, do a lot of camps and I just have a lot of community involvement with sports and HBCU outreach and things like that. And it's so crazy when a young girl or boy comes up to me and tells me that they look up to me. Even older people, middle-aged, young adults will tell me that, and it really impacts me. But I think the energy that I radiate out to others and how I am, and I'm just such a passionate person about anything that I do, that they really feed off of that, and they want to be indulged and be like that. So it – it's kind of weird to me, but at the same time, I feel like that's one of my purposes that I have had to do on during my time here on Earth. So it's it's a it's a blessing that I, I can be someone that someone looks up to, because even even with my college decisions, mm -hmm. um, my town is very my hometown I'm from a small country town is very divided. So when I made my decision to go to HBCU, it was a big controversy. But I didn't realize that when I was in high school fighting for a black student union and helping, um, I created a, a community thing called Human Dot Project, which helped homeless people and their needs and 
help them with anything they needed basically. Mm -hmm. And um, I was doing all these things and then I chose to come, come to Southern and people were like, what? But then um, after I made that mark, a lot of people started asking me about HBCUs and more information. And then now my high school, I was the first graduate to go to HBCU. Now there's 30 of them. Mm. So it's like I've really impacted so much to where people really want to follow in the footsteps that I'm going and they're enjoyed by watching it. So it's a it's a nice thing to be a role model. It really That's great. Strong in my heart. That's <laughs> great. That's great. It's so powerful. You know, it's 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 amazing, especially when you said about the young people coming up and looking up to you. And it's to, you know, you never know the impact that you're making on people, but young people are watching. Same question to you, Colin, um, as far as being that 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 role model uh, for young people who are looking up to you, whether you want them to or not, but they are watching you on a football field, watching how you conduct yourself, watching the things that you do. Um, you know, are you are you comfortable stepping into that role um, and being that 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 leader? Yeah, most definitely. So I have two younger brothers and I've kind of just been told my whole life, you know, you got to lead them, make sure you're doing the right thing. But I like how you said also whether you want to or not, mm -hmm. um, you know, stepping into a leadership role or just being an athlete on campus, like you have a lot of eyes looking at you and you're not we're not always perfect. That's that's the biggest thing I have to understand with myself, too, is like you're, you're not going to be perfect, but hey, I'm striving to be, and you're going to have some people that's going to tear you down. And mm -hmm. that's just the nature of life, sad to say. But, you know, I just look at it as like a challenge and, you know, just try to bring as many people as I can with me as long as I'm doing the right thing. Try to bring as many people as I can with me. That's great. That's great. Uh, Xavier, same question to you as far as stepping into to your, your role as a, as a role model. Um, like I said, whether you want to be or not, um, are you are you ready and comfortable with being that leader? Uh, yes, sir. I believe I'm comfortable with it. Um, and I also sort of feel like it's a duty, you know, and rather I'm ready or not, it's, it's going to be there no matter what. I'm always going to have eyes on you. Uh, rather somebody wanting you to succeed or fail. Um, but when I'm home, I try to work with as many kids as possible, rather it's my sport, other sports, or not even sports at all, just because I know that a lot of times right there, you can lose sight of what's in, fr what's in front of you, you know, when you're just younger. And I remember when I was in their, uh, in their shoes, how I looked up to even the guys that were just five or six years older than me, rather than 10 or 15. Um, and I saw them as superstars. And I have no clue, you know, what they were doing or what they weren't doing, but I saw them doing what I love on a field or on a court. Um, and I just wanted to be like them. And I wanted to, you know, walk like them, dress like them. So, for those kids that are seeing me like that, I want to make sure I'm setting a good example. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that athletes have to deal with um, when they do speak out, I mean, even on this topic of the of the bomb threats, um, you know, and they, they've been interviewing different students sometimes in different articles. And, you know, comment sections, I usually try to stay out of the comment sections, to be honest with you. But sometimes you can't help yourself when you peek in there. You just want to see what people's reactions are. And it's amazing to me the level of criticism that people have when they disagree with you. And even, even in something like this, as far as saying, well, you know, it's amazing that that now in 2022, we would have, you know, um, HBCUs being targeted, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a clear racial incident. It's not like they, they targeted all colleges, it was specifically HBCUs. And then you had all these people in the comments saying, oh, they're making it a racial thing. It just so happened that way. And, and like criticizing the different students that were speaking out and saying different things. And I, and I point that out to say that, you know, with, with especially with athletes, you know, of course, you've heard the shut up and dribble. Um, and people usually say that when they disagree with you. Usually they're just fine with you speaking out when they agree with what you're saying. Um, and that happens on both sides, the left and the right. But how do you deal with the criticism that comes along when you do speak out, when you do take a stand on something? Because that's something that is really, um, you know, inescapable because it's going to for sure happen. But Peyton, how do you deal with the with the criticism and the backlash? Um, something I tell myself all the time is, you know, yourself 
and you know what you're putting out in the universe and if I feel like what I'm saying is important or it's going to change something, then that's okay. Because at the end of the day, the only person that has to matter is myself. Mm -hmm. And so I, I try not to look at the comments. I know sometimes it does get hard. You have to kind of peek in the comments. But you just really have to know yourself and your own worth and have confidence in what you're saying and mm -hmm. not just saying something and oh I should not have said that no be confident in exactly what you want to say and don't have no doubt in what you're saying so if you have doubt in anything don't do it at all that's what my mom always told me that's <laughs> so, great yeah well, that's great advice that's great advice how about you Colin how do you deal with the backlash the haters the people that tell you to stay in your lane you don't know what you're talking about you're just a football player what do you know about this topic you're gonna hear all of that if you haven't heard it already but how do you how do you prepare yourself and how do you deal with that so first, I, when you was talking about that and how people just come in with the criticism, all I could think about was when Peyton talked about knowledge earlier. And a lot of people, they just don't know. But mm -hmm. then there's also a lot of people, they don't care to know. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard time I have dealing with because I'm always a person who stands on right. Like what's right? And sometimes it's clear like, okay, what well, the right thing to do is in your face. Like it's clear that 16 only HBCUs were targeted, targeted, so it has to be racially motivated. Mm -hmm. So, like Peyton said, you just focus on your focus on yourself and make sure you're doing the right thing, and try to bring as many people as long with you to 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 stand on this platform that we have. That's great. That's great, Xavier. Same question to you. Dealing with people who are haters, to people who are who are trying to criticize you when you do stand up and everything like that. How do you deal with that? Uh, yeah, as they both said, um, you got to know what you're talking about and, and have no doubt in whatever you put out there and whatever you have to say. Um, if you believe it and believe there's weight behind it, then you said what you said, you leave it there. Um, everyone's going to have an opinion, no matter what. And people might even change their opinion just to disagree with what you said sometimes. Right. Um, but like, at the end of the day, we are athletes, but first we're people. Um so, I mean, my opinion matters to just as someone else's, but I just said, you just can't waver. You have to know what you're talking about and know what you have to say and leave it there. You know, you know, and, and um, I'm asking all these questions because, you know, we're going to run this and, you know, Athletes for Hope is going to run this and there's going to be a lot of younger athletes who are watching this. Um, and you're going to, so you're, you're basically going to be giving them the tools that they need in order to be able to deal with some of these things. And, um, you know, I, I remember when I was younger and I would, you know, an athlete would come to my middle school and, and talk to me or my high school and talk to me. And for us, we listened to every word they said. I remember when John Starks came from my middle school, Carver Middle School, and we was like locked in, like every single word, you know? I mean, Wayman Tisdale came and we was like, oh man, this is Wayman Tisdale. We're gonna listen to everything. Um, and that's the, the, the power of the athlete voice. And some people shy away from using it you know what I mean? But but some people, um, you know, walk into it. And it's okay for the people who that's not really their thing. Because I always get this question, is it a, should it be a requirement for athletes to be able to stand up and use their voices? And it's kind of hard to say that because that's not everybody's thing. What, you know what I mean? That's not, every, you got to have a certain passion to do this, to be able to do this. What, what, what do you think about that, Peyton? I, some of my teammates, I'll use this as an example. Um, some of them aren't as vocal as others. And like, I, I can be very vocal. I'm not like a rowdy person, but when I need to speak, I will speak. I'm very observant and then I will talk. Mm -hmm. But um, some athletes, I think, I feel like, what would stop them from speaking out is like a self image thing. Mm. And I feel like they don't, they're too hesitant to say the wrong thing. And I feel like, like I said earlier, if you have confidence in yourself to say how you feel, like how I advocate for all these things, because I'm passionate about it, I'm confident that as long as I get this message out there, I want to get it out there. I feel like if they had that mindset, then it wouldn't be a problem, but I feel like a lot of people feel, I don't want to say restricted, but they don't want to 
put themselves out there like that. And that's fine. That's, you know, mm -hmm. you can't control people, but that's, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes, uh, Colin, the, and you mentioned before about everybody doing things together. Um, and sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, a lot of the times the athletes, I mean, look at Kaepernick when he first was taking a knee, look, he was look all like the other NFL players like, uh, let's just back away from him and see what happens. And sometimes you got to be by yourself. I mean, that, I, and that's a, that's a tough position to be in, to be honest with you. It's, 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 you know, the, the saying that it's lonely at the top, but, but, the people who have the courage to be able to stand up on their convictions, to stand up alone, those are the people who are remembered, you know, and, and, and that's, that's a, it's, it's a tough position to be in, but sometimes you have to stand by yourself. Sometimes people aren't going to stand with you. Have you seen that sometimes Colin? Yeah, I, I most definitely see that. And, you know, honestly, coming me personally, I'm, I'm probably not the I'm not the best athlete on my team. You know, I'm I'm not making all the tackles and sacks per game, you know. But, you know, I go up to my teammates who are and I tell them like, I promise y'all, y'all voice is way louder than mine. I just have the confidence. They always come like, how do you have the confidence to do it? And it's just it's it's in you. And it's on it's off of the platform you already have. And I treat every day as if like I'm going for a game, basically, an interview. Mm -hmm. And, and just like you're going to mess up in the game, you're going to mess up in life. Everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to see it. But most of the time, you win. If you win the game, and you may have messed up, but if you win the game, it sure does matter more about winning the game than that mess up you have. So I think that's the biggest thing everybody not really focusing on. Like, okay, yeah, I may make this group of people mad, mm -hmm. but I'm doing what's right. And that's my biggest thing. Do what's right. You know, one of the things that I love about your generation is that you have things um, accessible to you that, you know, even me when I was in high school, we didn't have. So, I mean, you can't imagine a world without cell phones, but I didn't grow up with cell phones. Only, the only cell phones we saw was on TV. You know what I mean? It was like Nino Brown and Zach Morris. Those are the only people we saw that had, that had cell phones. And nobody else had no cell phones. But y'all are able to organize and like call. So even right now, y'all are on lockdown. Well, not now, but before you were. You are still able to communicate and see what's going on. And back in the day, if we was on lockdown, we just on lockdown. Like that's it. We can't communicate until you know what I mean. Somebody either calls somebody or something like that. How has social media um, opened the door for activism on a whole nother level to y'all, um, Xavier? I'll start with you. Uh, it's surely a blessing and a curse, because um, like you said. And like we said earlier, everyone's going to have an opinion. So no matter what you do, you can be doing exactly what's right. Um, and you're going to receive some backlash. So I guess that's the negative side of it. But the positive side is you can – a lot of people don't want to do things. Uh, maybe they're busy. Some are just lazy. And some, like I said, just don't care enough. Uh, but social media and being able to do things like right from our phone just makes everything easier and more accessible. Um, and it limits a lot of the excuses. You know, like some people are still going to go above and beyond, especially the ones that care the most. But uh, it limits the excuses for those that don't care as much. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Peyton, you talked about earlier how you use social media. Um, and I think that's a great way to use it, to be honest with you, because as an athlete, you can be able to reach a lot of people so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so definitely keep doing that. But I want to talk to you, Colin, about social media as well. How, how do you feel that that, you know, social media can really be utilized to get your voice out and, and be able to organize and um, everything like that? So honestly, I'm not a big social media person. Yeah, I have an account. Mm -hmm. But besides watching like some TikTok videos, <laughs> I'm not like constantly on social media. Now, what I have going to do is certain accounts that I like, I've gone to put notifications Okay. Out there. And I've noticed that, you know, social media can get that information out there. And it, when it does, it get it out there quick. Mm -hmm. So but another thing is just I kind of sometimes I, I call social media a facade. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, I guess I, I can't really put it into words, but like social media can lead. Like Xavier said, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. It could lead some people the wrong way. 
Mm -hmm. And also those comments and stuff, it can also lead you off the topic of what we're trying to get out there. So I do believe it can be used. It can be used for a good, good reason. But I also feel like sometimes it can, it can hurt. I definitely agree. Um, But even what we was talking about before, as far as, you know, y'all were talking about before, as far as what you saw, like you heard the statements of the FBI and what they were doing and all top priority and, you know, uh, all their field agents are, are on it to make sure they get down to the bottom. But you look out and you don't see anything. You don't see no presence. No, that's something that I think people need to know. You know what I mean? Because it's it's almost like you become your own reporter. Like you become you you're you're breaking the news. Like, OK, you see this saying this and you could, you know, you know, show like, well, everybody is saying the same thing that we're not seeing what they're saying is happening. And it's a good way to put to keep people. Um, I don't want to say in check, but on notice that you're watching and you're not just take the thing about the media. Sometimes, you know, people accept whatever they're given from the media as if it's the gospel. You know what I mean? The absolute truth. And I think what social media does is allow you to be able to challenge that accepted truth to give another perspective. You know what I mean? Or another another viewpoint or to to disagree with what they said and to correct what other people are misinformation that they're giving. Um, so I just want to really encourage y'all to keep doing what you're doing. I love the, I'm about to follow all of y'all on Instagram, even though you don't use your, your stuff that much, Colin, <laughs> I would still follow y'all on Instagram. And I want to really encourage y'all to keep to keep using your voice because um, I can't stress enough how important it is. And I'm going to leave everybody with a last word. Um, but whatever you want to say, I, I was going to ask you who are the people that you admire and the other athletes that you that you um, have watched and been inspired by. And that was going to be my last question. But I don't want if you want to if you want to have another point that you want to make, you can make that point. So uh, let me start with you, Xavier, whatever point you want to make last. Um. Keep going, honestly. I know it sounds cliche, you know, uh, and everybody tells you it, but everyone tells you that for a reason. It's one of the things we hear all the time for a reason. Uh, and that's not just sports, that's just life. Uh, because sports kind of reflect how life goes. You're gonna have ups and downs, you're gonna have wins and losses. Uh, you're gonna battle some injuries, face adversity, no matter what. <laughs> no matter if you do everything, everything exactly right and exactly by the book, you're still gonna have to overcome some things um, and that's what makes you who you are, make, reaching the ultimate goal. That's great. That's great. Uh, Mr. Colin, last word for you. Uh, what popped into my head was don't take no for an answer. Mm. Um, so many times, so many times, like I've been, I've been told like, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Yeah. Oh, you you just getting this because of this, or you just getting that because of. But what I realized is like the calling on to everybody's life, everybody's life is different. Mm -hmm. But everyone has a specific calling, and I promise you, the world would not go around if we weren't all in our own calling. So be yourself, and like Xavier said, don't give up, but don't take no. If you got something on your mind, do it. It's there for a reason. It, it's not. It's not just out the wind like boom. God put that there for a reason. Mm -hmm. So now, don't take no. Keep striving and go hard. That's great. That's a powerful word right there. That's a powerful word. Okay. All right, Miss Peyton, you can bring us on home. Final word from you. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say something I always tell myself is to go with the flow, and. Um, that's one of my uh, reset mechanisms for softball. I always tell myself, go with the flow, go with the flow, go with the flow. Because like how Colin was saying, just staying true to myself and keep on pushing the way I'm pushing, everything's going to be all right. So I feel like that's something really important that people should incorporate in their life. Um, also, um, another thing, say positive affirmations to yourself because a lot of times we forget to – be proud of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I read um, a thing in the morning, every morning and every night. It's called a precious human life because you got to be grateful that you're here and you're able to do the things you do on a day to day basis. So 
um, go with the flow and live every day like it's your last. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, y'all, y'all are special, you know what I mean? And y'all are leaders and to be so young and being able to, you know, confidently step into that leadership role um, and use your voices and your, and your platforms. It's, it's, it's really special. Like I can't say it enough. You know, I, I let me just tell you really quickly. Um, I, I discovered my voice when I was in high school. Um, I had a situation where I was um, stopped by the police heading to a game. And, um, you know, they thought I looked familiar. Um, they kept me for 45 minutes. You know, back in the day, what they used to always do when they stop a black man, you have to get out your car and sit on the ground. And so I'm sitting there in the middle intersection, you know, all these cop cars are there, lights flashing, people looking, all this different stuff, um, 45 minutes. And they finally noticed that the reason why they, I looked familiar to them is because they saw me in the papers because I play ball. Not that they saw me from a mugshot, which is what they thought. So I, I you know, ended up, I, I also did speech and debate and I ended up writing a speech about it and I started performing it all over my town in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I, where I grew up. And I started getting a lot of recognition about it. And then so like you was talking about the, the young people that come up to you, a lot of the younger people and, and my peers were coming up to me and saying, hey, thanks for calling them out on that. Thanks for bringing to light what the police do. They do that all the time, but they don't listen to us. You know, and that's when I had like the light bulb moment, like, oh, they listening to me just because I play ball. You know what I mean? And that's when I, I just said, okay, I could use this play a ball thing and keep on pushing it and, and being able to bring things to light the way that the athletes that I admired growing up, like Kareem and, you know, Bill Russell and all of them used to do Muhammad Ali. And that's really where I saw the power of the athlete voice. So I tell, I say that to tell you to, to always remember how much of an impact you can make as an athlete in advocating for people who might not have the platform that you have because they're not the athletes. And that's the honest truth. Now, of course, it shouldn't be like that. Everybody should be able to listen to anybody who is speaking out on injustice. But but the reality is athletes have a bigger platform. So I just want to congratulate y'all, tell y'all much respect. And, um, you know, thank you for, for coming on this roundtable, on this, on this panel. And really keep doing what you're doing. Um, I'm going to tag all of y'all when we start posting this and everything like that. But um, much respect to y'all. So, so I took up enough of your time, but thanks a lot again for, for joining us tonight and um, and being open about uh, and everything that you're doing. So thanks a lot. Thank well, you for having us. Definitely. <laughs> yes. All right. Have a good night, y'all. All right, you too. You All too. Right.